In a game like this, we get a small glimpse of why Capablanca was Capablanca. Here we see the master at his best, and in this game, there's a move he makes that is so brilliant, and it would be the kind of move that it, you would pass over it very easily and not realize how much of a genius move it is if uh, we didn't give it some thoughts. So we're going to take a look at that. His opponent in this game is Edward Lasker, not Emmanuel Lasker, who was the world champion, but Edward Lasker, still a strong player, uh, an international master. Interestingly, he was born three years before uh, Capablanca, but lived almost 50 years after Capablanca's death. He lived to the age of 95 and passed away uh, at, uh, in 1981. And uh, he, he's most well known in the United States, at least, and maybe some other countries, for being a, a, a writer of chess books. His books are on bookstore shelves for decades and decades. So let us jump into this game, Edward Lasker with white, Capablanca with black. This was played at the New York American National in 1915. D4, D5, Knight F3, Knight to F6, C4, and E6. Just a standard Queen's Gambit declined. Knight C3, Knight B to D7, and Bishop to G5, the standard pin on F6. And here Capablanca plays something a little different. Uh, Bishop to B4, counter pinning. Uh, much more common is to just play Bishop to E7. Um, but Bishop to B4, and he begins to put some pressure on this C3 Knight. E3. C5. Already Capablanca is mixing it up with the black pieces. The center has a lot of tension. And uh, notice now this queen can come to a5 and increase the pressure that is already on the c3 knight. Bishop to d3 from Edward Lasker. Queen to a5, continuing to pile up. And of course, he's threatening to take the knight at the moment. Queen to b3, defending the knight. And uh, a little insight that I found. <laughs> Analyzing this game, the computers came up with a brilliant shot for black here that was not played in the game, and that's this unbelievable move, uh, b5. Really strong. If uh, cb5, then just c4 forking, and uh, dc5 again, the fork. So it's a, it's a lot of pressure on white's position after b5. Capablanca played the more normal uh, knight to e4. Uh, increasing the pressure on the knight at c3, and also aiming at this bishop at g5, threatening to grab the bishop pair. And after Edward Lasker castles, that's what he does. He uh, grabs the bishop at g5, knight g5, and now cd4. And one thing white has to be aware of is at some point, if, he, if uh, Capablanca takes on c4, this queen will be aiming at the undefended knight on the g5 square. Uh, so uh, Lasker has to be aware of that. If ed4, dc4... That would be a problem. The pawn threatens the queen while the queen attacks the knight. And if bishop c4, you take on c3 first. Obviously, if white just retakes, then he would win a, win a whole piece. So Lasker would have to lash out with bishop takes e6. And uh, he could get a couple of pawns, and Capablanca's king would be in the middle, but he would still be better up a piece. But uh, what he does instead is play knight to b5. What this does is block the queen's access to the knight at g5 and remove the knight, the threatened knight, uh, but now that allows knight to c5. Capablanca has already gotten the bishop pair. Now he's threatening to get the two bishops versus two knights in an open position, a strategic advantage. Queen c2, and he does take that bishop. Queen d3, and a6, kicking the knight back. The knight takes on d4, dc4, queen c4, and bishop to d7, and the opening is over, and we have our main position for the game. And we see that Capablanca has the two bishops and is already threatening to gain a tempo with rook to c8. So he definitely has gotten uh, an advantage, a slight advantage out of the opening. And of course, the knight at g5 is still hanging. Uh, he has to do something about that. So knight to b3 is played by Lasker. Um, if Capablanca plays the queen back to b6, to keep the bishop pair after a queen to g4, white may generate a couple of threats, but black is still actually fine here. But instead, Capablanca goes ahead and takes the knight, giving up the bishop pair, but he has a specific reason. After queen takes bishop, he plays bishop to c6. So while he doesn't have the bishop pair, he has one minor piece versus one minor piece, bishop versus knight, but the bishop is much stronger than the knight. This bishop is just incredibly strong. 
on this long diagonal. And of course, for the moment, he's actually threatening checkmate. Um, e4 is played by white to block, to gain some space in the center and to block that bishop at c6. But now a5, attacking the queen, trying to push that queen away from the defense of the pawn at e5. What Lasker does is play queen to d2, immediately offering an exchange of queens. And Capablanca usually was willing to go into an endgame, and he does here, queen d2. Knight takes d2. The knight uh, defends the pawn. Now, the main imbalance is here, obviously, the, the bishop versus the knight. Uh, but also, if you look at Capablanca's king, uh, it's closer to the center than White's king. And uh, so it can be it, it get a little more active in an endgame, which is, would be good for black. He castles long, and that comes with a tempo. The rook attacks the knight at d2. The knight goes to c4, counterattacking the a5 pawn, even though it loses the pawn at e4. And Capablanca takes that e4 pawn. But before Lasker retakes the pawn at a5, he plays a couple of in-between moves. First, he plays rook f to c1, threatening a discovered check down the c-file. Capablanca steps aside. And now he plays f3, kicking the bishop back and trying to limit its scope on this diagonal a little bit with this f3 pawn. The bishop goes to d5, where it stands as a tower of strength in the middle of the board. And now Edward Lasker takes the pawn at a5. And we can see the relationship of this uh, bishop to this knight. There's nowhere the knight can move where black can't capture it. Uh, it can move to a defended square, but at any point, if Capablanca wants to take that knight, he can do so. And uh, after this move, he plays rook to c8. Now, he's offering the exchange of rooks because he wants to play the minor piece ending. He likes his bishop versus the knight. And he feels that's a good position for him, so he wants to get all the other pieces off the board. After b3, giving the knight a square of support on c4, that is exactly what happens. And the rooks come off, and we have a pure minor piece endgame. And now Edward Lasker plays king to f2. Now this next move, this is the move. It's very easy to pass this move over and miss how much of a genius move this is. This is the kind of move that's sort of reserved for the Karpovs, the Carlsons, and the Capablancas. Uh, the most obvious move here is to just play b6. Kick the knight, basically force to c4, take, and you have two pawn weakness ver weaknesses versus one in a king and pawn endgame. But here's the problem. After king c7, king e3, king c6, king d4, white controls this c5 square with his king, and this is a draw. He can hold this uh, endgame because of his king position being superior uh, to Capablanca's. So what Capablanca does instead of that is this genius move, and it's the only move that wins as far as I know. I think that's true. The only move that wins here, yeah, is king to c7. That's a double exclamation point move, as innocuous as it may seem at first. It really is. And the idea is he wants to play king to b6 and gain a tempo on the knight. Then in that race for the control of the c5 square, he'll be up an entire tempo. So king to e3, king to b6, hits the knight. Now the, key, the knight moves. Now he takes, pawn takes, and boom, look at this. His king is now on the c5 square. He's up an entire tempo over, over that last variation, and that makes all the difference in the world. Now black is winning. Having said that, this is still a very, very tricky endgame. After king to d3, Capablanca plays the most obvious move, which is e5. But as it turns out, the, the real winning move here, and we see modern grandmasters play moves like this all the time, is the move g5. Uh, it's a strange looking move, but uh, it basically keeps a lot of flexibility in black's pawn structure, it gives him a lot of potential tempos uh, later in the endgame. If uh, g4, for example, h6, h3, f6, and black just has too many free tempos with his pawns, I have to say king c3, f5, and he would just advance, and then he would just win this race for this, uh, this f3 pawn. And if king to e4 instead, then just king takes c4, and this is totally winning for, uh, for Capablanca. But e5, a little less precise, and Lasker's response is correct. He plays g4, slowing down the expansion of black's uh, king side pawns. Black would love to play f5 here and keep this king out of e4, so g4 slows that down. f6 with the idea of playing g6 and f5, the same idea, just executed more slowly. h4, g6, 
and king to e4. And one of the threats here, of course, is to play g5 and weaken this e5 pawn. Uh, and if king takes c4, that's exactly what would have happened. g5, and uh, this is actually a, a draw after f5 check, king takes e5, and you get a bit of a race here. Uh, but they would both queen at the same time, and uh, this is a, a drawn position. So seeing that, Capablanca plays the move king to d6. He wants to keep this pawn defended. And here, the best move um, is h5, it appears. Obviously, the move g5 here would be a mistake because f5 check kicks the, kicks the king back. Uh, but h5 could have continued to keep that equality, that very dangerous close equality that white had here. But instead, uh, Laster does make a mistake here. He plays the move f4. And this permanently puts the endgame in Capablanca's favor. He takes here. King takes f4, and now king to c5, and uh, these pawns are too far away, and uh, that's it. White resigned in this position, but the game would have continued, say, h5, king takes c4, and there's uh, just nothing he can do, and then black gets the opposition, and either way white goes, he wins. So if king to c3, he goes king to e4 and wins on the king side, and if uh, uh, king to e3, he goes king to c4, picks up the a-pawn and wins on the queen side, either way. A brilliant endgame from Capablanca, and many players, I think maybe even GMs, modern GMs, would miss the subtlety of that move, king to c7, gaining that extra tempo he so desperately needed to give him the victory. I hope you've enjoyed this endgame masterpiece by Capablanca. See you again soon at Chess Dog. Goodbye.